Sheila Akers is going to be a great grandmother again, right? Melissa and Sean Brown are expecting a sibling for their daughter Maddie in May. And mom and baby are doing very well. The whole family is excitingly waiting and preparing for this wonderful spring arrival. Now, while doctors can't give expectant parents the exact, they give them a frame, a time frame, but they don't give them the exact date or the exact hour that that baby will come. Families just have to wait. And sometimes that waiting is, is tinged with fear. For the mother, it could be fear of the pain and fear for her un <coughs> the safety of her unborn child. For the sibling, it could be fear that the parent's love and their attention will be withdrawn. Or it could just be afraid of a schedule change. And for the dad, I think there is a fear of the responsibility of a growth, of needing to support a growing family. But most of the time, the hope outweighs the fear, and families wait with joyful expectancy. I think Paul drew on the common experience of childbirth to explain the timing of Jesus' return. Paul says that the day of the Lord will come on as suddenly and as inescapably as the birth pangs to a pregnant woman. But Paul encourages the Thess Thessalonians by reminding them that they are children of the light, sons and daughters of God, who are not in the dark about what is to come. And he paints a picture of strength and perseverance and self-control. And he tells them to put on a breastplate of faith and love and a helmet of hope. And he urges them to encourage each other and to build each other up. Now we've been examining the letter from, Thess from Paul and Syl Sylvanius and Timothy to the Thessalonians for the last several weeks. And we've learned that this letter was written as a follow-up to the missionary's visit and to address the fear that some people thought that those had already died would not have a chance to be in eternal life with God. And the letter tries to instill hope, hope that the Thessalonians can continue to live that radical lifestyle of Christ followers in a culture that, puts, that does not look after the poor, but that puts emphasis on status and wealth. Hope that allows them to worship God with confidence in a culture that bows down to the political power of Rome and cows to the military might that is ever present. Paul is writing to remind them that God's peace and justice came in the form of Jesus. A leader who demonstrated that God's radical love by taking risks and bashing through the boundaries that separated the people and inviting everyone into God's realm. A leader who set a compelling vision for the people and then emboldened them to follow it. And a leader who, had, who could reveal the inbreaking of God's possibilities and through whose death and resurrection was a promise of God's realizing the whole kingdom in the future. Paul uses the language of the military to conquer the fear and feelings of oppression caused by the Roman military. And so he says, put on faith and love as a breastplate to guard your hearts and to steal you for life's long journey. And put on a helmet of hope to protect against negative ideas. Live alert to the needs of others, building each other up for service to God, supporting one another so that together we're all together and no one is left out and no one is left behind. What an astounding vision for the Thessalonians. What a wonderful vision for us, too. Throughout the months of September and October, 
Several of us have been putting together the call to action. That's Delmont's long-term plan. It's our goal setting. And we've really struggled to figure out who is living in our neighborhood, <coughs> what needs they have, what needs we have. How can we work to alleviate the poverty, the hunger, the loneliness, and the brokenness in the world that surrounds us right here at Belmont. At certain times, it got discouraging, and we just wanted to throw up our hands and say, let's just take care of ourselves, let's just do church. But that's not Jesus' way. And so we, we kept on talking. The command to love God and to love neighbor is simple, it's direct, but it requires strength, and stamina and hope. And so these words from Paul have been an encouragement to us also. <clears throat> We've come up with 25 SMART goals. Goals that are specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. And we hope these goals will help us meet the vision of inviting everyone to experience God's love and to grow as Christian disciples and to minister to the needs of the people in our church and outside of our congregation. <coughs> Inviting and growing and sending into ministry, these are the actions that we've been hanging on to. Imagine being part of a community in which you knew that you were accepted and valued. A place that no matter what life threw at you, illness, job loss, marriage breakdown, loss of a spouse, no matter what life threw at you, you could still find support. And this community doesn't love you because of what you do or because of how much money you make or what kind of house you live in. This community loves you because you are a child of God just like they are a child of God. And it isn't a club or a civic group just trying to do good. This community is built on a deep, enduring love of God. And because the community is fueled by God's love and founded on those high ideals of Jesus, you're always called to grow to mature, to become stronger and stronger in your faith. Like a flower planted in good soil and given all the nutrients you need, you're expected to bloom as God has intended. And then members of this community, when they are strengthened, are sent out in to, to gather others into God's love and to make a difference in the world around them. This is the vision that leaders at Delmont see. A vision of inviting, of growing, and of sending into ministry. Our SMART goals provide measurable baby steps into that vision, but it's going to take the willingness and the work of the whole community to make it a reality. Next weekend, on Saturday at 11 o'clock, we're holding our charge conference. This is a time that we state what we've accomplished in the past and we affirm and set goals for what we're going to do in the coming year. In preparation for this, the, the leaders have completed a congregational and pastor evaluation. <coughs> we've developed our call to action. We have proposed a budget to support that work, and we've come up with a new slate of leaders, or mostly full slate of leaders, to guide our ministries and keep us moving forward, holding us responsible to those SMART goals. But I think still that fear is holding us back from being fully engaged in God's work. These are some of the fears that I've heard. Fear of commitment. Can't commit because I'm worried about being pulled in too many directions. There's too much on my plate already. 
fear of public speaking. Can't lead because I can't speak to groups of people. Fear of not doing a good job. I can't help because I might make a mistake. I don't know how to do the whole job, so I'm not going to do any of the job. And besides, my work won't make a difference anyway. I'm afraid of making a fool of myself. Beth Ann made a really astute comment the other night in Bible study. She said, sometimes God calls you to give your gifts where you feel comfortable. And sometimes God calls you to the places that are uncomfortable. We often volunteer to use our strengths for God, but sometimes God calls us out of a place that we think is a place of weakness to go and grow. God could be calling us through our fears to grow past our fears and accomplish great changes in our world. She said that visiting in hospitals and meeting people in pain was initially frightening for her. But she has followed God, and now she's been recognized as a chaplain for Christ in mission, motion? Christ in action. Great. So I ask you, can some of you stay behind church occasionally, stay a little later, you'll be home by noon anyway, and become a counter so that our money is handled well? Could someone who is detail-oriented help us pay our bills and keep track of our money and make sure that we're financially on track? Those of you who it's really important what worship feels like, could you be a greeter, or an usher, or help plan worship, or sing, or read scripture? There are some of you here today who have a nurturing heart. Could you help us invite back to worship those who are absent? Could you invite some people into Sunday school or Bible st study? Commitment is fright frightening, but if you feel today that God is tugging at your heart and you could help a little bit more, if you could help us fulfill those baby steps into our vision, could you please speak to Amy or to myself after the service? Because we need your voice, we need your time, we need your energy, we need you. Paul encouraged his followers to put on faith and hope and love, and he didn't want folks to sleepwalk and stumble right through life. He wanted members to live alert to the needs of those around them, building each other up for the service to God, supporting one another so that all were together and no one was left out and no one was left behind. We too have a vision in which everyone is invited and emboldened and sent. A community of together where no one is left out and no one is left behind. And this community, we're building it right now and we're calling you to be active in it. We hold this vision and move towards this vision because one day Jesus will return and God's justice and mercy will be complete on earth. And what we can experience now only in part. But the time is inevitable and inescapable, just as labor pains are to a pregnant woman. One more story. When my daughter was in labor with granddaughter Molly, and Frank and I met the Smith family at the hospital so that we could take Megan overnight. As we were leaving, I turned to Richard and I said, when that baby is born at 3 o'clock in the morning and she's healthy and she's beautiful, don't call me. I'm going to be asleep. Wait till 5 or 6 in the morning. I need my sleep. <laughs> so when the Molly was actually born at 3 o'clock in the morning, the doctor who had overheard this conversation had a good laugh. And he said, this is a beautiful daughter. But don't call that granny, because she needs her sleep. 
Unlike Molly's arrival, I don't have a clue about when Jesus is returning. But like Paul, I do have a hope that the people at Delmont will live until that time alert to the needs of others and that you will continue to grow and become stronger and more able to give service to God. And that we will continue to be a community of togetherness where no one is left out and no one is left behind. I know you can do it. I know that we can do it. Amen. Amen.